Good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here and to welcome everybody who is listening in online. Um, a few of you might know me. I have taken over from Pam Armstrong as chair of the Friends Committee um, of the BSA. And uh, this is the last of the lectures organized by Pam, a series that was on Messenia and Laconia. Um, and I will introduce Tony in a moment. We're very lucky to have him with us. Um, the next series of lectures is going to be on Crete. So we'll be starting on the 15th of June with a Zoom only lecture, which is going to be given by Dr. Philippa Steele. And then there'll be a hybrid lecture on the 4th of July with uh, Professor James Whitley. Anyway, it is, a, I just have to give you one or two instructions about uh, asking questions and things. Throughout the talk, you'll see a Q&A feature available. It looks like two speech bubbles, one on top of the other, into which you can type questions for the speaker. Only you, speaker, and the host will be able to see these questions. After the lecture finishes, I will read out a selection of questions that have been received online, and also we will take questions in the room, and our speaker will respond. You should see a small window in the top right of your screen. If this gets in our way, you can mouse over it and either move it around your screen, or you can click on the bars above it to make it smaller. I hope that this is all clear. The Q&A protocol will be repeated at the end of the lecture. I would also uh, ask you kindly that in these dire times, which are dire for everybody, including the British School at Athens, if you were willing to make a donation, there will be a donation uh, box coming up on your screen and uh, anything that you can donate would be greatly appreciated. Now, it's a huge honor for me to introduce not only a very famous person, but also a great friend of mine, and that is Professor Tony Sporthorse. Tony is the Emeritus Professor of Ancient History at Newcastle University. I'm not going to read everything it says about him because it's all on your flyers, but he is extremely eminent. Uh, he did a PhD in Birmingham and he wrote a book co-authored with Paul Cartledge, which was his PhD, Hellenistic and Roman Sparta. He's gone on to write several other books and the one that he wrote in 2020 uh, has been now translated into six different languages. About a few weeks ago, he published his last book, not his last, <laughs> the last to be published. <laughs> and it's published by Yale University Press, and it's called What the Greeks Did for Us. So it sounds quite an interesting read. I would say that Tony's lecture this evening is called The Athenian Family of Herodes Atticus and the Spartan Contest of Endurance. Tony, over to you. Um, thank you very much. Mary Christine. I refer to Mary Christine as my co-pilot because giving a lecture these days, it's a bit like being on the flight deck of a plane. I mean, there's so much in the way of uh, things that you have to kind of watch out for. Um, I'm going to read my lecture rather than extemporize, which I think is doing a service to my audience um, and um, that's partly because there is some Greek epigraphy in it and it's quite easy at least for me to um, muddle Greek epigraphy and um, a word-for-word -word sentence to accompany whatever the slide is I think is safer ground. Um, I'd like to start then by um, thanking Pam Armstrong who first invited me to give this talk and also Mary Christine Keith for repeating the invitation uh, to speak to the BSA friends. And I apologize for the earlier postponement of the talk owing to, I think we agreed on the wording, unavoidable circumstances. Um, originally, it was timed to proceed and help prepare the ground for the sightseeing tour of Laconia organized for the BSA friends starting on the 19th of April. Um, so I thank all of those of you who have um, troubled to tune in, both the uh, seen and the unseen, and um, uh, the scene, I can say, is a rather exclusive gathering here in <laughs> London. 
So um, now to get started, um, it's a talk and it's in four segments. So that was my original, I don't want that. Let's go to that. So the first segment is an introduction. And um, in this talk, uh, what I want to do is to offer a reinterpretation of a Greek inscription of some eight lines from Roman Sparta. And it's lain unpublished for decades in the storeroom of the Sparta Museum. And if I'm right in what I think this inscription signifies, it suggests how Greek elite males in Roman imperial times continue to identify strongly with the old military culture of the Greek city-states, the old military culture that is back in the increasingly distant days when citizen males also formed the citizen army before the Pax Romana from Augustan times onward effectively demilitarized the provincial Greeks. The inscription, as I understand it at least, also suggests the continued exceptionality of Sparta in Greek eyes under the Pax Romana. Roman Sparta was a Greek city with a military tradition admired even by the Roman ruling class, including Roman emperors. Finally, this is my pitch for the interest of this text, at least to me, the inscription suggests how a strategy of deliberate association with Sparta's military tradition might have helped an ambitious Athenian family to enter Roman imperial society at the highest level. This Athenian family produced one personality who enjoys a wider fame today, mainly because buildings which he gave to Roman Athens have been patched up and are still in public use. And I refer to the plutocratic Herodes Atticus, Greek orator and Roman senator, indeed one of the um, consuls of AD 143. That's his full name. And that's an introduction, by the way, his full name there to the habit of um, the senatorial elite in the second century AD um, to give themselves lots of names, what um, the historians call polyonymy. Well, um, the inscription in question has just been published by a Greek scholar to whom I'd like next to pay tribute. Dr. Georgios Steinhauer, known to many of us as George, was ephor of Arcadia Laconia in the 1970s. And here is one half of George in 19, I'm sorry, George, should you be listening? In 1976 at Hector Catling's Menelaean end of dig party with um, Hector on his left. Well, the inscription in question is included in this two volume study of Roman Sparta, which appeared late last year. And here I feel I must insert my personal gratitude to George because many decades ago, he generously let a British PhD student off the leash in the storeroom of the Sparta Museum, where many at the time unpublished inscriptions were stored. And with George's generous permission, I was able to copy and take account of many of them in what I wrote in my PhD. And this in turn became the half of um, the book already mentioned by Mary Christine, co-authored with Paul Cartledge, Hellenistic and Roman Sparta, a tale of two cities, still, I believe, in print. So George's new study is titled Gaios Iulius Eurocles. Well, not necessarily a Spartan name to conjure with, although 
Gaius Julius Eurocles is, I should think, the best known of um, the Spartans of Roman date, um, whom we hear of as individuals. And this is because he was a protege and a friend of the Roman Emperor Augustus. And with imperial backing, Eurocles founded a turbulent dynasty of Romanized client rulers of Sparta, which lasted on and off until Nero's reign. Now, George's new portrayal of Eurocles, it merits a talk of its own. George touches, for instance, on Sparta's continuing role in the late Roman Republic as a military power dominating the Laconian seaboard, on the role of Eurocles himself at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, when he pops up commanding a war galley as a naval ally of Octavian, the future Augustus, and gives chase to none other than Mark Antony himself as Antony abandons the uh, sea battle to chase after Cleopatra. And the uh, book also uh, has much to say, including much that is new, on the nature and achievements of, and eventually the local Spartan resistance to, the Spartan overlordship, which Augustus bestowed on Eurocles sometime after Actium, along with the grant of Roman citizenship, which is why he uh, became Gaius Julius Eurocles. And this is a, um, a, a specimen from an issue um, from the Spartan mint under the Emperor Augustus. Um, and the issue um, is in the name of Eurocles, as you can see. And um, many, but not all scholars, um, take um, this coinage minted in the name of Eurocles as an aspect of the evidence for his overlordship of Sparta. Well, this evening, I'm not going to linger on Eurocles, however. It's a bit of a dead end in the way I've given you. George's study also includes publication of a significant series of new inscriptions, including um, a number of those which he um, let me copy and um, uh, use in my PhD back in the 1970s. And as I said, it's on one of these that I want to focus tonight. Well, in my second segment, which I'm now moving on to, I'll say something about the society and institutions of Roman Sparta. And this segment um, I composed really with the BSA friends in mind. So it is a bit of a case of closing the stable door after the horses bolted. <laughs> so there we are. Um, well, returning to elite Greeks becoming Roman senators in the lifetime of Herodes Atticus, that is to say, uh, in uh, the course of the second century AD, the Roman Senate was recruiting Spartans as well. And here we have a Spartan senator. This is a headless statue of a certain Claudius Brasidas, and it resides, or at least it used to reside, in the garden of Sparta's archaeological museum, where I took this photograph eons ago. Now, typically of important provincial Greeks, Brasidas, like Eurycles, was a Roman as well as a Spartan citizen. Now, an indicator of his senatorial rank, according to Professor Nick Secunda, is the footwear of this statue, no less. And apparently what this footwear does here is it combines a Greek style with the lacing distinguishing the special type of shoe permissible only to Roman senators. Now, as it happens, Roman legal writings also record a family lawsuit heard in the court of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, so in the AD 160s or 170s 
And what this case involved was a Spartan senator called precisely Brazidas. And the details in the law code about this Brazidas's divorced wife and their two sons exactly fits what other Spartan inscriptions tell us about the family of the headless Brazidas with the semi-senatorial shoes. So I think the identification is firm. He's not wearing a toga. He's wearing a so-called hematian, which was sort of Greek civilian dress. So it's a kind of combo style of dress, if um, Professor Secunda is correct about the footwear, which I'm sure he is. Well, this inscription is just one from a rich harvest of Spartan, in, of Spartan inscriptions of Roman date. And by this time, Sparta's epigraphic habit has gone from, as it were, famine to glut. So uh, just in the period when most historians of Sparta don't want them, um, you get all these um, inscriptions. Now, inscriptions, it's often said, focus on the elites of the ancient world, and that is true. But it's worth pointing out that the Spartan corpus of inscription, inscriptions does reveal all sorts of people, slaves, freedmen and freedwomen, and artisans. We hear of bakers, cooks, a wreath seller, a maker of palms, and of sculptors, not to mention a small-time trader and his tombstone from the second or third century AD poignantly describes a hard seaborne career of, I quote, laboring across much of man's unchanging earth and striving to sail the unremitting waves of the open sea in order that sudden fortune might give him something good, unquote. And it would be interesting to know what he traded and from which harbors, but that does give you a flavor, I think, of what these small time traders uh, were like. They would have their cargo probably on someone else's merchant vessel and would pitch up um, in such and such a port, um, hoping um, to find a seller. And of course, um, to find a seller was um, by no means uh, uh, always um, going to be the case. Um, one Greek writer says that um, Delos in the first century BC, when it was this great Mediterranean port, was the one port where um, a trader or merchant was guaranteed um, to find a market for whatever he was um, logging. Spartan inscriptions, moving on, also shed light on the families of these individuals, their wives, daughters, and teenage sons. I'm talking about the um, elite. In fact, what I've just done is missed out a paragraph. Yeah. So I'm going to go back um, uh, and uh, go on to say that um, despite what the inscriptions do tell us about um, the um, uh, ordinary, uh, the rank and file, if you like, it remains true um, that above all, they are a goldmine for the study of Roman Sparta's civic institutions and politically active citizenry, what we might call its town councillor class. And especially in the first half of the second century AD, the so-called Roman High Empire, this town councillor class could not stop celebrating itself on stone. It generated copious catalogues of various boards of annual municipal officials, this is a typical example, a list of the annual ephors. It also went all Roman and um, generated whole careers like this one of individual office holders. And this kind of inscription, I think, and it's not just me who thinks this, does look like a pale imitation of the Roman cursus honorum. And you need to have arranged your municipal offices annually in order um, to be able to uh, have a cursus honorum, which you move through um, from lower to um, higher office. And that seems to have happened by this date at Sparta. 
And many of these um, two classes of text were found inscribed on a retaining wall um, at Sparta's um, Augustan period theatre. And um, those of you who went on the tour um, maybe were shown this inscribed wall. Well, Spartan inscriptions also shed light on the families of these individuals, their wives, daughters, and teenage sons. George's book, for the first time, offers a photograph of this Spartan inscription from the reign of the Emperor Augustus. So the late first century BC, maybe um, the very early first century AD. And it's unique from Sparta. It praises an aristocratic Spartan woman for her virtuous wifely conduct during no fewer than 60 years of marriage. Now, given the date, this civic praise um, might well have been inspired by the moral model and uh, also long lived marriage of Augustus and his hyper wifely spouse, the Empress Livia. And both Augustus and Livia um, did, in fact, visit Sparta. And by the way, when I say aristocratic, I do so advisedly um, because Sparta's town councillor class was dominated by a very narrow aristocracy of birth. And um, I mean by that um, families who considered themselves superior um, by virtue of their descent from illustrious ancestors, which they were forever showing off in the honorific epigraphy of Sparta, and they like to claim descent from divinities in the Spartan pantheon, such as Poseidon and Heracles, and also from famous Spartan generals, such as Brazidas and Lysander, not to mention the old Spartan royal houses. Well, moving on, Roman Sparta's epigraphic Gold mine also includes records of the achievements of Spartan teenagers as they passed through what the Roman Emperor Augustus, in a new inscription published by George, calls Sparta's, I quote, ancestral upbringing, unquote. And the um, Greek word used for upbringing is agoge. These records include um, numerous stelae, like this one on the screen. This one records an offering by a young victor in a singing contest celebrated in the sanctuary of the goddess Artemis Orthia by the river Eurotas. This is a rather dispiriting archeological site um, that we see today. using the reverse, having gone too fast. Yes, because I did, uh, I did want you to note in lines three and six, um, a word which is italicized um, and kind of untranslatable because we don't really know what it means. Um, in Sparta's Doric Greek dialect, kasen, and I'll come back to kasen, shortly. Yes, so there we are. Um, this uh, was a very old sanctuary. Um, it had continuous cult dating back to the early Iron Age. In Roman imperial times, its chief focus was a venerable Doric temple, that um, rectangular uh, foundation that you can see off center on the screen along with its outside altar, which you can just see the remains of um, to the right and slightly lower than at about three o'clock um, of the temple. Well, by the time of Augustus, for certain, the Spartans had also created a theatrical area for spectators here in the sanctuary. Preserved from this Augustan phase is some stone seating from the front row, dedicated by the local bigwigs for whose use it was presumably intended. Now, 
the BSA excavators also found remains of something far more monumental, a Roman style quasi amphitheater, no less, of which this is an artist's impression. And there you can see the temple, the altar facing it, and the quasi amphitheater. And this was erected, it seems, um, around AD 300. Now, to date, no other Spartan sanctuary of Roman times has produced archaeological evidence for this level of investment or for such continuity of evident importance in civic life. So I'll say something now about how I think one must understand this transformation of the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia in Roman times. And to do so, we must bear in mind the peculiar status of Roman Sparta's civic training, the aforesaid agoge. Now, on the one hand, most, if not all, Greek cities under Roman rule continued to organize a voluntary training for citizen boys who had reached the age of puberties. Puberty, not puberties. These trainees were known as effi boy, effies. Typically, they might receive a modicum of intellectual training. There would also be athletics and a paramilitary element, including arms drill. Under the Pax Romana, Ephibes, to our knowledge, were now the only citizens in a provincial Greek city who still received arms training. As adults, these ex Ephibes would provide the local police. As for the social standing of such Greek Ephibes, Simon Hornbler has compared them to, I quote, young gentlemen, unquote. So the sons of the town councillor class in Sparta's case. On the other hand, the Spartans of Roman times consciously presented their version of this um, phenomenon of um, the Ephibic training as something uniquely Spartan namely as a continuation of what they called the so-called customs of Lycurgus. And what they meant by this um, was the militarized way of life supposedly founded by their semi-mythical lawgiver of that name, Lycurgus, um, to whom the Greek biographer Plutarch around AD 100 uh, uh, dedicated um, one of his lives, disarmingly beginning it by saying that um, he couldn't be certain um, that Lycurgus had ever actually existed. Um, but Lycurgus was a big name in uh, Roman times. Um, all uh, educated um, Greeks and um, educated Romans too, probably by um, the time of Herodes Atticus, would have heard of him. Well, where the Ephibes of Roman Sparta were concerned, what we find is an unusual, if not unique, emphasis on physical brutality and endurance. And this late reinvention of the so-called customs of Lycurgus attracted considerable interest from outsiders from both halves of the Roman Empire. And this interest is detectable from the 70s BC until as late as the AD 330s. And Spartan investment in facilities for spectators, in my view, must have catered to this outside interest. We should imagine the audience in the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia as including not just the family and friends of the young Spartan contestants, it might also include elite visitors to Sparta, the likes of Cicero, of Plutarch, of Pausanias, all of whom wrote about the Ephibic training of Roman Sparta, not to mention quite possibly emperors Augustus and Hadrian on their attested visits to Sparta. Hadrian came not once, but twice. As we're now about to see, these outsiders above all came to see one of these contests that was notorious in the Roman world as a bloody spectacle. So in my third segment, I want to look more closely at the newly published text in question 
And this is my own photograph of the stone, which I showed earlier. And I took it in the storeroom of the Sparta Museum so long ago that I'm no longer sure of the date. I think early 1980s at the very latest. And this is George's photo, a vastly better one, taken from his book. The fine spot is unfortunately unknown and so can't help out with interpretation. The stone is a marble plaque, roughly 18 inches wide and high. And as George um, has noted in publishing the text, the text is a list of graffito-like entries in a series of different hands. And um, George uh, distinguishes five hands, prima manus, secunda manus, et cetera, um, whereas I see four. The first three entries associate a male personal name in the nominative case with nouns in the nominative case, Nike meaning victory, and in one case, Kratos as well, meaning mastery or something like it. George described these entries as good wishes. I think one can be more specific. In fact, what we seem to have here in my view is a unique record from Sparta of acclamations, literally in ancient Greek, boi, shouts. And here I quote from the late Ernst Badian's entry for acclamation in the Oxford Classical Dictionary. Quote, vocal expressions of approval and good wishes in ritual form were an important part of Roman life, unquote. We now know that acclamations in Greek cities under Roman rule could sometimes at least be inscribed. And the best known examples come from Aphrodisias in Asia Minor in Western Turkey. To my knowledge, this Spartan text, if I'm interpreting it correctly, would be the first inscribed record of these shouts or acclamations from Roman Greece proper, and from a much earlier time than the late antique Aphrodisian examples. Now, as for where these Spartan acclamations took place, good wishes for Nike or victory point to crowds cheering on contestants in a competition. Since these acclamations address individuals, the contest in question must have produced an individual winner. A further clue to setting is the appearance in line seven, of that same indeclinable noun, chasm. Already met with, this word is found only in Spartan epigraphy, where it appears as an archaistic term in use among the youths or Thebes in the Roman period civic training. It seems to relate to another rare Greek noun, chasis, known from ancient lexica, meaning brother, or cousin. At Roman Sparta, Cassin described a youth passing through the civic training, the agoge, as a dependent and perhaps fictional kindred of a youth of higher social status who perhaps paid his training expenses. In this particular inscription, the word Cassin is preceded by an archaizing form in the Doric Greek dialect for the masculine plural definite article, toy, instead of hoy, as if the vernacular to be heard in a crowd of shouting Spartans of Roman imperial times could still include traces of the old Spartan dialect. And I read lines five to eight as all in the same hand, Soitsiteles, son of uh, Polystratus and his brothers, victory, mastery. Well, the next question is, can the contest be identified? Now, George didn't pursue this point. In fact, we hear of a Spartan crowd in Roman times shouting encouragement at contestants in a specific event of the training. Writings refer to this contest as 
the wits, and also as the contest of endurance, Greek carteria. The best evidence for this contest is in the writings of the satirical Greek author Lucian, who was a Greek from Roman Syria, who flourished in the mid second century AD. He was a coeval of Herodes Atticus and indeed mentions Herodes Atticus um, in his writings. Now, one of um, these writings, an essay by Lucian, the so-called Anacarsis, is a fictional conversation between two wise men. One of the wise men is Greek, the other is non-Greek. And um, their subject is the training of the young, especially in athletics. And the dialogue is set in sixth century BC Athens. However, modern scholarship, uh, notably Harvard's Professor Christopher Jones, has emphasized that Lucian's account, I quote from Professor Jones, <laughs> accords with the ancient literature and inscriptions of Lucian's own day. He refers to institutions known only from authors later than the classical period, such as the contest of the whips at Sparta, end of quote. Well, in the dialogue, the non-Greek is particularly baffled by the seeming senselessness of this Spartan contest of the whips. The Greek wise man describes how young Spartans were flogged naked while passively holding up their arms at the altar of Artemis or Thea. And I quote Lucian now, dripping blood while their fathers and mothers stand by and are so far from distressed by what is going on that they actually threatened to punish them if they should not bear up under the stripes. As a matter of fact, many have died in the contest, not deigning to give in before the eyes of their kinsfolk while they still had life in them, or even to move a muscle of their bodies. You will see that Sparta honours paid to their statues, which have been set up at public expense. End of quote from Lucian. Well, two points arise from that. Firstly, these exhortations from parental bystanders must have been shouted, so they were a type of acclamation, in other words. Secondly, the reference to public statues of contestants, and this is the um, text on a statue base found by the BSA during its excavations at the sanctuary of Artemis or Thea. And it's a public statue in the name of the city of Sparta, but paid for by the brother of the Honorand. The Honorand is described as extremely well-born and as extremely courageous. And I'll come back to this emphasis on noble birth. And the Honorand also has a title in line three of, well, line four of the edited version of the ancient Greek. Beaumonai case, and that literally means victor at the altar, Beaumos and Maike. Well, um, Professor Nigel Kennell, in his um, study of uh, Spartan education, including um, the civic training of Roman imperial times, the books called Gymnasium of Virtue, uh, Nigel Kennell has reconstructed this whipping contest as a series of knockout heats. And he estimates the initial number of contestants as around 70. And the reward, as it were, for the last youth standing was the title Beaumonikes, and at least sometimes a public statue, just as Lucian says. So Spartan epigraphy bears that detail of Lucian out. And here we have a well-born Spartan youth who won by enduring the whipping longest. I mean, we assume this isn't posthumous, but can't be sure. <laughs> well, lastly, in this um, segment, I come to the identity of the youths in um, George's new inscription. 
Now, um, Nasistratus and Soixiteles, um, these are both um, well attested Spartan names in Roman times. What's really startling, to me at least, is the first named contestant, Herodes, son of Hipparchus. Now, Herodes is otherwise unattested as a Spartan personal name. However, as this family tree shows, we have here, I think, none other than Tiberius Claudius Atticus Herodes of Athens, father of the famous Herodes Atticus. Now, the father um, was um, the son of a Tiberius Claudius Hipparchus, who was a very rich Athenian, who was also a Roman knight. The father um, was himself a Roman senator. He was um, admitted to the Roman Senate under Emperor Trajan. And we now know from a recently published Roman military diploma that um, the father um, reached the Roman consulship in AD 133. Now, George hesitated about this identification, but really there can be no doubt. It's confirmed by two published inscriptions from Sparta excerpted on the screen. The first excerpt names an adult Spartan who, back in his time as a Spartan youth doing his civic training, had been Cassan to an Atticus. And this Atticus has to be the same Athenian Atticus who had been his Ephebic sponsor and one time fellow of Phoebe. He's um, called Herodes in uh, the uh, list of acclamations. He's called Atticus here. And these polyonymous um, upper class Romans of the second century AD are a kind of nightmare for modern historians because. Um, contemporary inscriptions and indeed uh, literary texts um, can refer to them um, by um, different elements in um, their uh, long Roman names. So um, the date of this is right of um, um, Herodes, the father, um, Atticus as he is here passing through the training would have been very late in the first century AD. Inscriptions, um, yes, sorry, moving on to the second excerpt. This records a Spartan who passed through the training as a fellow of Phoebe of a certain Atticus, son of Herodes. Now, Walter Ameling, who is the Herodes Atticus expert, he showed on chronological grounds that the Atticus of this second excerpt can only be the Herodes Atticus, that is to say, not the father, but the son. And what these two extracts show, even before the new inscription, is that um, both father and son had passed through the Spartan training. And um, the fact that they did, um, these are the most striking items in what is known of the extremely close ties between this family of Athenian grandees and Sparta. Well, as already seen, um, Alta Victors or Bomonaiki um, could be praised for their noble birth. That the contestants in the contest of endurance included well-born youths is also borne out by an extraordinary vignette in the travel writer Pausanias. And Pausanias um, states that the priestess of Artemis or Thea oversaw the whipping contest at the altar while holding a portable statue of the goddess which she'd fetched from the temple. And this would grow heavy in her hands, Pausanias credulously records, if those doing the flogging lightened their blows because of a boy's rank. Now, going back to Lucian's dialogue, it emphasizes just how extraordinary this public whipping, which is what in effect is going on, of young gentlemen was. 
Flogging in the Roman world was a punishment meted out to common criminals, as Lucian's non-Greek wise man points out. It's something that happens to sort of thieves and robbers. The young Herodes Atticus, son of Hipparchus by contrast, was not only a Roman citizen, but also the son of a rich Roman knight. In real life, even had he committed a crime, no Roman court would have sentenced him to a public flogging. Well, in my fourth and last segment, I'll try now to sum up why this new inscription is, to me at least, um, such a revelation. Now, current research recognizes that Roman Sparta's whipping contest was an invented spectacle, a spectacle with the veneer of great antiquity. The bloodshed, the cruelty, and risk of death held an obvious appeal to Roman or Romanized taste. We're in the world, after all, of gladiators and wild beast shows taking place in venues such as the Theatre of Dionysus in Roman Athens. The Athenian writer Xenophon in the early fourth century BC des describes the remote ancestor of the contest of endurance. Spartan lads in his day had to snatch cheeses from the altar of Artemis or Thea while running the gauntlet of adults armed with whips. The young gentleman took part in the Roman version of this contest leaves in no doubt that many contemporaries, both within Sparta and beyond, saw competing in the whipping contest as a source of personal prestige or kudos. And this was presumably so in large part, if not entirely, because it connected them to the revered figure of Lycurgus and to the old Spartan military glory. Well, Roman attitudes too are crucial here. And the Romans had what we might call a soft spot for the Spartans, stories circulated of kinship between the two peoples. The Sabines, for instance, one of these stories claimed were Spartan by descent. Latin literature even preserves a legend that the cult statue of Artemis Orthia, in fact, originated in Italy, having been offloaded onto the Spartans from a shrine outside Rome. This special favor in which Rome held Sparta seems to have peaked under Augustus and again under Hadrian. Key to Roman admiration was the legend of Spartan militarism. The Roman historian Livy wrote that Sparta in Roman eyes was above all distinguished for its, and he uses the Latin word disciplina, meaning its military discipline. For the Romans, the Spartans were seen as paragons of the martial spirit, at least compared to other Greeks. I say compared to other Greeks because broadly speaking, the Romans stereotyped contemporary Greek manhood in what we now call racist or proto-racist terms as soft, as lacking in physical courage and as unsoldierly. And this was a black mark against Greeks, given that the Romans took great pride in their own strict military discipline through which their ancestors had established Roman supremacy. A coin issue like this one of Emperor Hadrian underlines the unfailing value which the Roman imperial state attached to good military discipline. On the other hand, a generation after Hadrian, a Roman provincial governor, could uh, describe the undisciplined legionaries under his command as Graikaniki, which literally means Grecianized. Well, as I see it, the Spartan military discipline in its Roman period reinvention held a particular virtue in Roman eyes. The very fact of this reinvention shows that the Spartans themselves were fully aware of this Roman admiration. As for Athens, generations of contact with elite Romans stretching back at least to an earlier Herodes, who was a, con uh, who was a friend of Cicero, 
will also have made the Athenian family of Herodes well aware of the selective nature and preferences of Roman so-called Philhellenism. The exceptional social success of this Athenian family in a Roman world needs emphasizing. Atticus, his son Herodes, and a son of Herodes, not only all sat as Roman senators, but all became Roman consuls, three generations in succession. Herodes and his son achieved the even greater distinction of becoming a so-called consul ordinarius. And what that meant was um, that you were one of the two consuls who held office first in the consular year under um, the imperial um, system and um, who gave um, their name to the year, just like the old Republican consuls. What also stands out are the terms as Spartan ephebes of two successive generations of the family. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given the nature of the contest of endurance, foreigners volunteering for Roman Sparta's paramilitary agoge are otherwise hard, if not impossible, to identify. As for the link between a Spartan paramilitary training and this Athenian family's senatorial ambitions, the late Professor Tony, Tony Burley, a professor, uh, sorry, a pupil of Sir Ronald Syme and an outstanding senatorial prosopographer, Tony suggested that Herodes was, I quote, a reluctant, unquote, Roman senator, as you know, they were sort of too posh to um, uh, um, put themselves forward as Roman senators. They had to be talked into it by the emperor. Well, um, I think on the contrary, uh, what the Spartan flogging of Herodes, son of Hipparchus, suggests to me is the need felt by a certain type of Greek to garner as much cultural credit in Roman eyes as he could. The type in question is a well-documented type, the ambitious Greek provincial grandee seeking advancement in Roman society and specifically admission to the Roman Senate. And it needs remembering that Roman senators under the Pax Romana provided the senior officer class of the Roman army, commanding legionaries, giving them orders, and generally implementing the Roman military discipline. With all the prestige of the Spartan legend behind it, the contest of the whips with its veneer of the antique offered, again as I see it, a respectable form of a kind of Greek virility test for a family of elite Athenians seeking acceptance as thoroughly Roman by a Roman establishment long suffused with negative Greek stereotypes. So the real conclusion now. <laughs> well, uh, Roman Sparta's extreme paramilitary training was not, I don't think, as the older scholarship sometimes suggests, and as maybe I did once in sort of earlier stuff I've written, it wasn't a masquerade or an archaistic crowd pleaser. I think it was heartfelt, and I think that it embodied truths about Greek elite culture at the time. The contest of endurance was a public mortification of the flesh, of a kind which can be found in other societies in other times and places when likewise it can channel deeply held beliefs. In Roman Sparta's case, not the ordinary majority, but the Romanized families of the local elite, perhaps a few hundred people played the dominant role or rather their teenage sons did. The motive was a kind of ancestor worship to reenact a prestigious ancestral tradition, prestigious not least because it was esteemed and valued by the Roman ruling power to which the Spartans were now subject and whose outlook Romanized Greeks by the time of um, Atticus, father and son, must to some extent have internalized. These stills from the film 300 show the pulling power even today of the legend of ancient Sparta. The film offers an improbably buff 
ideal of ancient Spartan masculinity, realized, it is rumored, with the help of CGI and abdominal makeup. <laughs> oh, um, likewise, in the contest of endurance at Roman Sparta, as in the film, what fundamentally was at stake was, I think, a question of manliness. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony. Um, I'm just going to put you through your a little mini test of endurance because you'll have a brief take questions. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. So, I was um, wondering where you were going. <laughs> <laughs> no, we weren't going to run you down the aisle. <laughs> but before I do this, I am once again going to say how you can ask a question online. Uh, you look at the two speech bubbles, one on top of the other, and you can type your questions uh, for the speaker. And as I said before, only you, the speaker, and the host can see these. And we will, after I've taken a couple of questions from the floor, select a few of these questions received online and to which Tony has agreed to respond. Ooh. So if, is there anybody in the room who would like to start off with a question? Please. I just wonder how large was the Roman population in Greece at this, at this during the period? Well, they had they colonized Greece? Like uh, well, um, we're told that um, Greece under Roman rule was depopulated, but it's very hard to get a handle on, you know, because the ancients thought that um, a civilization in decline, by definition, um, must have lost population. Uh, by which was meant adult male population. Uh, so you can't really necessarily take literally these statements in uh, some uh, contemporary writers, but probably there had been an absolute uh, decline in population, but it's terribly hard to uh, estimate. I mean, maybe a place like Sparta, living in the town, perhaps you might have had, but this is purely a guess, maybe you had about 10,000 or so, including, you know, free slaves and their descendants and so on in the second century AD. A place like Athens would have been larger. And then you have a couple of Roman colonies which were settled uh, from Italy, which were both very uh, prosperous at this time. Corinth was one. People have estimated, um, and I can't remember offhand what the estimates are, for, for Corinth. Um, but yes, imagine, I think, Greece under the Pax Romana as being less populous than it was in its classical heyday, when you, anyway, for all sorts of reasons. Were the Greek, were the Greek colonists in, 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 in Italy, were, 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 were they very Romanized? Well, some of them were kept artificially Greek by Romans who liked Having, who like being able to go no further than, say, Naples, one of these Greek cities in question, you know, to taste a bit of uh, the Greek way of life. Um, yeah, others had a different fate um, in the late Republic and under the Pax Romana. <clears throat> I presume the answer to this will be no, since you didn't submit it. <laughs> but um, given that the sort of the phenomenon of Greek style paideia was a sort of empire-wide phenomenon, something for which the Roman elite would pay, I wonder if there's anything to suggest that maybe members of the Roman elite, rather than just the local Greek elite in Sparta, participated in this for a fee or something similar. No, well, no, so, yeah, no, no, I do. I mean, you, you know, I mean, you think of Commodus going into the arena, uh, and uh, I mean, there, there, there's, you know, Augustus had to ban Roman senators from uh, fighting as gladiators. So the Roman senatorial class uh, from Augustus on was certainly a very different kettle of fish from, say, um, I don't know, um, the Athenian upper crust of the fifth and fourth centuries BC. As it happens, we don't have any evidence for that. 
but we the closest I can get to it is a I think there's a story in a, a, a scolia which may or may not be correct about um a a Spartan woman wrestler she must have been a professional athlete who was competing at Rome and a Roman senator called Palfurius Sura this would be in the first century AD uh, got down into the um, arena and sort of took her on um so <laughs> Nothing possible, it? So it's not impossible, and 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 we, you know, I mean, envisaging this kind of thing is is very hard because it, it's very hard to envisage the kind of culture which and the kind of atmosphere which could have produced an event like that. I mean, it really is, um, it, it, especially when you know there's quite a lot of archaeological and epigraphic evidence to suggest that Sparta, under the Pax Romana, in many other ways, was just like any other provincial Greek city, you know, with mosaic floors and sort of hot baths. Uh, but you have this very strange world. Um, mm. I mean, you can sort of, in my view, anyway, that's another story. But yes, it's a really, I like that. I think, yeah. yeah, some Cicero I think, rolling yeah. up his toga. Yes. <laughs> and we know who won. <laughs> who, who, in, in, in which case? Oh, no, I don't think you do. No, no. So it was the woman. Okay. You know. I just have a few questions online. One is from Julia Villa asking where exactly um, Nick's going to publish this notion of semi senatorial truth. Oh, yes. Um, I've got his um, PDF at home. Maybe, maybe I could say you would contact her after. Yeah, yes, I could contact you afterwards. It's in a collection which I think came out in the noughties on Sparta and Laconia, edited by, I just can't remember the details, but it's in there with lots of photographs of um, senatorial shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a very affectionate message here from Paul Clark, which, oh. uh, who says, Nick is a brilliant paper. He also asks a question. Uh, he says, Herodes was a very proud Marathonian, witness recent find at his Noni Luku estate, but the star of Spartans had failed to show at Marathon in 490 BCE. How might Herodes Atticus have squared his two city allegiances? Oh, very good question. Thank you. For that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, well, I think very easily. I don't, I don't think that upper class Romans really had much difficulty in thinking about the Spartans and uh, the Athenians in more or less the same breath. I think they associated them with uh, different prestigious cultural traditions. As I said, I think for the uh, Roman establishment, Sparta was um, about military glory. It was also, and this is important, for the Romans, it was also about using your military prowess to dominate other people, to create empire, imperial, and of course that's how the Spart that's how the Romans had used their military discipline. So they felt akin with the Spartans for that. Um, you know, the Athenians were in there as well um, with an empire uh, won both on land and sea in the fifth century BC, which the Romans were aware of. The Romans, of course, also thought of um, Athens above all in terms of its uh, uh, cultural traditions, uh, all that stuff, art, architecture, philosophy, and so on. But I think the point about Marathon, for me at least, is that for Herodes Atticus, it wasn't so much about being a proud Marathonian, so much as seeking to associate himself um, with the Athenian uh, tradition of military victory at this most famous of um, Athenian battles in which um, ancestors won over against the Persians. And that's why um, Herodes was so keen to emphasize his family's alleged descent from Miltiades, who was um, the Athenian commander at Marathon, if I've got that right. And I think it's also why he was um, so keen to uh, translate trophies from the battlefield at Marathon to his estate at Luku, um, to the southwest of Argos, such as this recently found apparent 
casualty list, an Athenian citizen casualty list from the Battle of Marathon. And he was up to other things as well. But I think with quite a lot of these um, top-notch provincial Greek grandees, what you wanted to do, if you possibly could, was to find an ancestor who was um, a sufficiently renowned military figure in Greek history that even Romans might have heard of him, you know, who might have got into, say, Cornelius Nepos, um, a first century BC writer of um, short biographies of um, famous Greeks. That's what I think, um, uh, what I actually, since you've got me going, and I'll just, and then I'll shut up, okay. but what I actually also think, and I suggested this in a book I wrote in the, uh, uh, which came out in 2012, is that what Herodes, what the family was kind of doing was um, kind of refashioning themselves as um, a sort of hybrid, um, that is to say, both Spartan and Athenian, in order to kind of tick all the boxes uh, with um, the Roman establishment. And of course, what you might say, and this would be a harder question to answer by far, is, well, how do we know what the criteria were um, by which um, provincials were admitted to the Roman Senate in the first place? And we know that imperial favour counted for a lot. We also know from the resistance under Claudius to Claudius's announced intention of admitting the Gauls from so-called long-haired Gaul, the part of Gaul that Caesar had only relatively recently conquered. There was great senatorial resistance to the widening and provincializing in that way of the um, membership of the Senate. That there was a kind of, that there was a sort of ordered and settled view probably about um, who should be admitted and who shouldn't. And uh, we, we do know, for instance, uh, that a lot of the kind of first generation Easterners who were admitted to the Roman Senate um, were in fact from Italian settler families. And so they, in a way, could sort of offset having lived in um, the Greek speaking East for as long as they had by their Italian ancestry, often in fact, um, descended from say, uh, military, Italian military veterans. It was more problematic for, say, a family like that of Herodes Atticus. They did not have that kind of ancestry. Uh, before I go on to the next question, power of technology, uh, an answer for Sheila. The article is in volume 16 of British School of Athens Studies. Volume 16 is Sparta and Laconia from Greek History to Pre Modern. And the next Sunday article is in there, Laconian shoes with Roman senatorial laces. So that's that answer. Now there's a question here from Susan Walker. She says, thank you, Tony, for a really fascinating talk. Could you say a bit more about how this tabula was used? Are the texts of the same period, though by different hands? When was the tabula framed? Was this part of the record of contests? Um, hello, Susan. Um, and thank you. Good comment. Um, well, you know, it, it, it looks as you saw it on the screen. I wondered if it was in fact a marble roof tile, because you do get roof tiles from, say, the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, damaged by earthquake in the first century BC, and then used because they were sort of still considered sacred somehow, no longer on the building, but taken down and um, reused as uh, um, an inscribed surface. I don't know, that didn't look to me, but I'm far from being an expert on um, marble roof tiling like a roof tile. So the answer is I've simply no idea whatsoever. I've never seen a, a Spartan stone, an inscribed stone that um, remotely resembles um, uh, what um, I showed earlier. Uh, um, as for date, well, I mean, Herodes, son of Hipparchus, um, heads the list. And if all that I've said, and if specifically my identification is correct, then the earliest uh, inscription can't be any later than, well, something like the AD 90s. 
And then the later ones, I haven't, to be honest, actually done my homework on the later ones to check who this Manassistratus might have been, who this uh, Soixatelis might have been, but the names crop up in known town councillor families of the second century AD. Who, kn I, who knows how it could have worked? Was it on display in, for instance, one of the gymnasia um, of Roman Sparta, you know, to which the sort of blood-soaked survivors of the contest of endurance um, might have eventually returned to for a sort of cold shower. I don't, you know, I just don't know. So instead of being frivolous, I should just say, I don't know. Great. We'll take two more questions. One is from Mariana uh, Reichel. She says, what precisely in the inscription you showed us made you think of Artemis Orthia? I might have missed something you said. Also, how do you interpret the letter M next to another name in the inscription? <laughs> Good question. That, that, I, I, I had a little paragraph about um, the Mew, which um, I overlooked while reading. Uh, and it, it's hard, I mean, George, George, I mean, perhaps wisely uh, said nothing. Um, what I wondered, uh, because I think the Greek goes Manasistratu Nike, and then you have the letter uh, Mu. Uh, what I wondered was whether this was in fact an alphabetical numeral, which should have a sort of an acute accent on it in the edited text if so, which would stand for 40. And in that case, was, was the shout along the lines of 40th victory of Manassistratus. And if it were, well, what you would have to accept is that the um, agoge, which we do know was organized around a series of contests, um, uh, uh, the effies going through it, passed through a series of contests. Is it possible that um, you could notch up as many as 40 victories? Uh, one would need to do a bit more work. I mean, if you also competed as um, a so-called pice or boy in um, more standard athletic festivals, not just in Sparta, but elsewhere, places like Olympia, say, or the Isthmia at Corinth, um, maybe you could get yourself up to um, 40 by the time you um, bared all, literally, in the uh, um, Artemis Orthia contest. And um, the first part of the question, the, the argument for the, con the inscription having an aphibic con context is both the appearance of the word kasen and um, the fact that um, individuals are being cheered on to victory. That gives you an aphibic contest. The other element in my argument is the fact that we have a second century literary source, namely Lucian, who is quite specific about how at one of the events at the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia, namely the contest of endurance, um, the contestants were cheered on by the spectators. So that is the kernel of the argument. I would add a fourth, which is that that contest was so notorious that it's sort of hard to imagine the other contest getting people quite as excited as that particular contest did. And, you know, if I'm right, one would like to know who was cheering for Herodes, who was Athenian, but, you know, he was ultra, well, I mean, the family was ultra important and, you know, no doubt, um, there were Spartans willing to root for him. You know, perhaps his mum and dad were down there in the audience. I mean, you know, that's silly. We we just don't know. Um, the final question. This is from Johannes Engels, who asks, if your proposal for the interpretation of Kassen is correct, might there perhaps be some influences from Crete on Sparta? Well, thank you. Um, yes. 
is the short answer. I, I, I mean, it's a sort of, it, it, it's an absolute viper's nest wading into the question of influence and origins, because by the time that we are talking about, or that I am talking about, the late first century AD, there has been, you know, it's rather like the coronation. We've just had um, all this new stuff unveiled and we're told it's part of the tradition. And you, you have to imagine, I mean, not quite a thousand years, but centuries of this going on um, with um, the Spartan upbringing. And it, it's certainly the case that as late as the time of Augustus, um, upper class Spartans remembered the kind of connection with Dorian Crete, because the guy Julius Eurycles, just to give one example, um, whom I mentioned in my talk, um, his family claimed descent from Radamanthus, who was um, um, a mythical Cretan judge in the underworld. But that's as much as I can say, and I, I just haven't sort of kept abreast with all the theories about links with Crete and so I'm afraid that's the rather disappointing answer. Well, it certainly hasn't been a disappointing lecture. <laughs> but I would, before I just say thank you to Tony, I would like to mention one other thing, and that is that Kate Smith is leaving us on the 12th of May. And this is really a huge loss for the BSA. <laughs> she has been absolutely fundamental, particularly in London, to the running of the BSA for the last few years. And I think she deserves a huge round of applause and a huge thank you, and also all our, our best wishes for her new career. Returning to our speaker this evening, I would certainly like to thank Tony Sportforth very much, and maybe make my own little acclamation <laughs> <laughs> for him, for what was a fascinating lecture, not only on the sort of um, reinvention of this uh, test of endurance in Roman times, but also Roman attitudes towards the Greeks, which I have certainly not really realized. So, Tony, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mike.